Greetings. My name is Jeremy Speed Schwartz, and I'm a founding member of the League of Imaginary Scientists. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists is an interdisciplinary art collective. We focus on animation, video, interactive media, sculpture, and performance. Our work has been featured at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, at the Art Museum at the University of Memphis, and as far away as Ireland and Mars. We are primarily concerned with the division we see in our culture. And this is a, a division that we know to be false. It's the division between art and science. That socially we think of things as either artistic or scientific. We think of people as left-brained or right-brained. We tend to think of work as either meaningful or meaningless. And all of this is not true. The League of Imaginary Scientists attempts to find the bridges that cross this gap, and when they don't exist, we build our own. We work collaboratively with artists and scientists in different disciplines. And when we work with artists, we ask them to incorporate scientific methodologies into their work. And when we work with scientists, we ask for the opposite. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. We can restate this mathematically. It'll be simpler. Beauty is equal to truth. Truth is equal to beauty, QED. Now, in science, we're not so much concerned with truth. We're concerned with ideas that are falsifiable. And what I mean by that is ideas that can be proved false. Right? So the problem is that the truth can never be proved false. The truth is not falsifiable. And things that are not falsifiable in science are not important. And by this, I mean you can't get a grant to study them. <laughs> so if the truth is not falsifiable, and the unfalsifiable is unimportant, through the principle of substitution, we arrive, therefore, that the truth is, therefore, unimportant. <laughs> QED. <laughs> now, follow me here. This is where the math gets difficult. If truth is equal to beauty and truth is unimportant, through the principle of substitution, once again, we find, therefore, that beauty is unimportant. QED. And this, as an artist, is extremely freeing, right? If beauty is unimportant, then we're free to make all sorts of wonderful, horrible things. And the opposite, the reverse, is also just as true. The unimportant is beauty. So what this means is that maybe the things we might overlook, the things we might exclude from our data, the aberrations, might be where beauty lies. And this is especially pressing when we're approaching this era where we don't know what an expert is anymore, where instead of singular expertise, we're flooded with a numerous number of unimportant, unfalsifiable truths. Dr. Stevens, please roll the first clip. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists has come to Earth's Buffalo, New York to answer unfathomable queries and jury-rig your understanding of everything. Where once you were ignorant and uncultured, you will soon gain untold knowledge in the capable hands of the League of Imaginary Scientists. As the universe's only imaginary science collective, the League has traversed wormholes, re-engineered entropy, and dived onto the very surface of Mars. Artists don lab coats and write equations, while genuine doctors run naked and write haikus. The unexpected results of these experiments serve as launching points for all collaborators involved, and become points of reference for a society rapidly redefining expertise. The League of Imaginary Scientists, expanding your understanding. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists works in two different kinds of collaborations. Collaborations with artists, and collaborations with scientists. When we collaborate with artists, we ask them to examine the scientific and artistic mythologies that they work in, and sometimes invert them. So for example, I mentioned before that in science, they're looking for ideas, hypotheses that are falsifiable, that can be proved false. In the arts, we often start from a point of view of our own experience, or our point of view, things that can never be proved false. It, the League of Imaginary Scientists starts from ideas we already know to be false, and then we make up the data to support that. So, for example, there are wormholes in the fabric of the universe, and these wormholes are created and maintained by gigantic, time-altering, intergalactic worms. 
And in order to travel these wormholes, you have to be screened to ensure you have the appropriate weaponry, sharp objects, and large bottles of undefined liquids in order to fight off these giant, man-eating, dangerous annelids. And this was the uh, starting point of Wormholes, a piece we did at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles in 2011, where visitors to the museum space were prodded and quantified and measured and abused, and then some of them were allowed to travel through our wormholes to different times and spaces. And this is one of the mythologies we like to examine, this idea that scientific advancement is fundamentally utilitarian, that when we discover something new in science, something as esoteric as wormholes in the fabric of space, whatever that means, that it's going to provide us, our society, our culture, some kind of benefit, that it's going to change us personally, when in fact we know that most of the scientific advancement that's happening right now is not likely to affect us at all. In the 20th century, there was a movement towards what's called process art, where artists started to say that the process of making art was more important or as important as the final product, that they started exhibiting the process as product. Now, in imaginary science, we take this one step further, and we exhibit the experiment as product. And this is the basis of another piece we did at the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Zephyr Experiment, where we invited gallery visitors to build flying and floating machines based on their aesthetic understanding of air travel. Without any instructions from us, we put a framework, gave them materials, and they constructed things, and then we launched them. And most of them were abysmal failures. In fact, almost all of them were abysmal failures. But that's okay. In fact, that's great. Because when you are looking for falsifiable ideas, when you are trying to falsify an idea, Finding evidence that doesn't support your hypothesis, finding evidence that disproves your hypothesis, is as important as finding evidence that supports it. A failure is a success. And to push this point home, we ended the evening by launching the largest paper airplane ever constructed by the League of Imaginary Scientists. And it did fly 20 feet straight down and landed on its nose with, to thunderous applause. <laughs> Dr. Stevens, please roll the next clip. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists can evolve you. The world is becoming ever more scientific and mechanized. Plants now refer to power plants. Farming is something done offshore or online. Relationships are increasingly preceded by the letter E. Do you ever feel obsolete? You should. You are obsolete. You are too human. The League of Imaginary Scientists can help. You too can evolve into a better being. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists has already brought the world of science to art, but can it do the opposite? Can it bring the world of art to science? Now, in our collaborations with scientists, we've worked with NASA geophysicists, biologists at MIT. We've worked with uh, researchers at the Groundwater Institute in Memphis. We've worked with uh, engineers at Bradley University. And in our collaboration with engineers at Bradley University, we were tasked with the creation of an interactive model of entropy. And entropy is a measure of disorder in the universe. It tells us the flow of time. It tells us the direction of time by saying that in the future, things break down. Things have a lower energy state. And this is a really important principle in engineering, but in all of the sciences. So we're working with a team of engineers, and we found very quickly that the engineers were really set in their ways. They were very goal-oriented. They wanted to know exactly what they were going to be responsible for constructing. They wanted to know that from the beginning. And the artists we were working with as well kind of were against this, that they wanted to make sure that there was room for experimentation, that there was room for, uh, for improvisation at the end stages. They didn't want to set anything in the conceptual phase that would um, break the later phases. So there were some engineers that kind of bridged this gap. You can see above me Dr. Zietlow wearing his entropy suit. Um, the helmet actually does cause and measure disorder. But most of the engineers were very adamant on that side, and the artists were adamant on the other side. We had reached an impasse. And so the engineers suggested this tool that they use in engineering. It's called a Pew Matrix. And the Pew Matrix works like this. On one side, you put all of the project ideas you have, and then you rate them on a number of different scales. So in this particular project, we were concerned about things like cost and the ease of construction. The engineers also threw us a bone, and they put in a column for aesthetics, how pretty it is. So um, everybody in the group rates 
each project based on these scales. And then you average those scales, and you add them up, and the project with the most points wins. And the artist absolutely freaked out, and understandably, because this idea of quantifying or measuring our work as artists feels really dangerous. It's painful, because we're coming from a personal point of view. We're coming from something where uh, we're trying to express a way of seeing the world. And the moment you put math into it, the moment you try to quantify that, that starts to feel really scary. And we were scared as well. It wasn't just the other artists we were collaborating with. And as soon as we started to feel that fear and that pain, we said, then we have to use it. If this is a tool that is going to scare us this much, if this is something that's going to cause us this much pain, I mean, it must be necessary. Let's give it a try. So we did. And uh, we used the Pew Matrix, and we actually ended up printing this out in large size and installing it in the gallery. We printed out the Pew Matrix, and we, we uh, perverted it a little bit. We ended up doing all of the projects and aligning them to the Pew Matrix and allowed the gallery visitors to decide which ones were most effective or which ones were the cheapest or most easy to construct or the prettiest. So as artists, we also tend to look for dramatic points. We tend to find what's the most exciting part of idea and how do we mine that or expand it or blow it up into this huge project. And when we were collaborating with the uh, Groundwater Research Institute at the University of Memphis, we were told that they had an old landfill that had started to leach into the aquifer, that there was pollution going from this landfill into the groundwater supply. And as artists, we thought, this is fantastic, right? <laughs> You can do a project so easily about this kind of alarmist sense of there is pollution in the groundwater. It takes 40 years when it gets seeped in. 40 years later, you pump it back up and you drink it. This is dangerous. Everybody freak out. This is dramatic. It's exciting. So when we arrived in Memphis and started talking to the people at the Groundwater Institute, we found out very quickly that the ratio of leachate, of pollution, to water in the aquifer was so tiny. It was almost homeopathic. There was almost none of it in there. If you were to fill up any glass of water, you wouldn't actually get any of this pollution. It was completely harmless. And to represent it as otherwise would be a perversion of their research. So we reformed our idea. We went back and we said, OK, if it, it takes about 40 years from when these things go into the aquifer to when it gets pumped up, what if we use the aquifer like a time capsule? And we invite gallery participants to come in and say, well, what kinds of ideas or things or pollution would you like to have in the future? What kinds of pollution would you like to send your descendants? What kind of pollution is coming to us from 100 or 200 or 3,000 years ago? So I talk a lot about the way that uh, the sciences affect our work as artists. And we gain a lot from it. We gain new perspectives. We gain new ideas, ways of conceptualizing, um, and totally new ways of going about projects. But what about the reverse? What do the scientists that we work with gain from these kind of collaborations? I mean, we're not very good at being a mouthpiece to their research. A lot of the times, we don't understand it fully. Um, and besides that, we're changing things around, trying to make it more dramatic, trying to make it more exciting. Um, and really, if they wanted the publicity, they should be publishing in reputable journals. <laughs> but we're nearing what has been called the end of expertise. And this is a time when knowledge, rather than being concentrated, gets dispersed. That the means of finding information, the research tools, the data, rather than being accessible only to a few, is accessible to all of us. It starts to blur the lines between what it means to be an amateur and a professional. And the arts have already dealt with this. Technologies like the camera, technologies like the computer in the arts already blurred this line between what it means to be an artist and what it means to be a professional. And the way that artists dealt with this primarily was to start looking at their methodology, to question what it meant to be an artist, and to start bringing in methodologies from other disciplines. Things like, how do you involve dance in painting? How do you involve music in sculpture? Eventually, how do you involve anthropology in your painting or in your sculptures? And so here's my hypothesis, and I pose this to all the scientists I work with, and I'm going to pose it all to you. And it's maybe not a falsifiable hypothesis. Maybe it's just true. And this hypothesis states that if a conceptualization process or a methodology or a point of view works in one discipline, if it produces results, if it is fruitful, then it will work and produce results in a disparate discipline. The process of realigning your point of view to make that work is valuable. And the more distant those disciplines seem in our social common consciousness, 
the more fruitful that cross-pollination. Dr. Stevens, please roll the last clip. Yes, it's true. The League of Imaginary Scientists wants you to join the quest for new methodologies. Try mapping the human genome using your great aunt's cake recipe. Explore quantum physics through the works of Shakespeare. Plumb the depths of space using actual plumbing tools. By working together, we can build a faster future. Thank you. <laughs>